we're going to get started. Uh, I want to give as much time as possible uh, to Mike, um, who is um, a, a good friend and uh, also a uh, really amazing in instructor. So I'm, I'm really excited uh, to have you guys here. Uh, my name, as many of you know, is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder of BizHack and the uh, host of BizHack Live. And uh, I'm excited to announce that this is the, the beginning of our third season of BizHack Live. Uh, we were recognized for seasons one and two by the American Marketing Association. Um, and we're here because so many of you have supported this effort um, over the past years, uh, over the past year by coming first and foremost, in some cases by presenting like Rosemary, uh, and many of you have also contributed um, by buying a season pass. Uh, that really helps defray uh, you know, a small portion of the costs associated with doing this every week as a service and making it be able to be free for all of you. So uh, BizHack Live is a live webinar series. We hold it every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about streamlined financials for small businesses with Mike Lingle. Um, Mike, um, I'm going to do, uh, when I introduce you, a more personalized introduction just about how we've worked together. Uh, but you have a really amazing background, having worked with some of the top um, business educating uh, com companies. And you've also uh, started quite a few companies of your own, uh, including Rocket Proforma, your most recent. Um, I did want to uh, encourage you all um, to participate in supporting this weekly community service through a season pass. Uh, the season pass, which is just $50, will give you uh, calendar invites and uh, email reminders of all of our upcoming events. You don't have to register for each one anymore. Um, and the benefit uh, of it also is if you can't attend, you'll still be sent a recording of it uh, and any ancillary materials that we develop. So it's a great off, uh, opportunity for you to get a lot of value uh, out of these sessions, even if you can't attend in person, and you can support a cause that I know many of you really appreciate. And so uh, in order to do that, just go to BizHack Season Pass 2021.eventbrite.com. Uh, and Lilia, if you could just put that link into the chat, uh, would very much appreciate you guys supporting season three uh, of BizHack. We have an amazing lineup, which I'll talk about uh, after Mike's presentation uh, of upcoming events uh, all the way through um, the, the first quarter of this year and beyond. Uh, as I mentioned, we were recognized uh, for Global Campaign of the Year by the American Marketing Association for the work that we did on behalf uh, of small businesses. There's Lilia with the, the prize and uh, we're so very proud uh, of the work that we've been doing um, to just help the small businesses during what remains a, a really challenged environment. Um, we're very proud of our partners, uh, the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association and Miami Marketers. Um, and with that, I wanted to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Mike Lingle. So Mike uh, and I have been kind of in each other's orbit for a couple of years now. Mike first presented uh, in BizHack a couple years ago, uh, a presentation, a very great memorable presentation about how to pitch uh, and how to do a presentation using free tools like Google Slides. Uh, it was really eye-opening. You taught me actually about um, font pairs and colors uh, graphic design elements, uh, you know, you want to have kind of a, a color scheme with just a few defined colors. Um, and no one had ever stopped in my entire career and explained that to me. So I really sort of saw you in action. And then more recently, um, after many years of working with startups and coaching uh, presentations and pitch decks and, and financial statements and building a few financial statements for your own businesses, you started Rocket Pro Forma, which is a uh, startup company, uh, re relatively young still, that's developed an incredible tool to help you with financial modeling if you're a small business or a startup. And so uh, I actually was lucky enough to be a part of Mike's uh, two week course in how to use the tool, learned a lot uh, about financials um, and, uh, and financial forecasting, which has always been 
uh, an area where I needed to to, to work uh, as a business owner. And so, uh, Mike, thank you so much, and welcome to BizHack Live, and for kicking off season three. Thanks, thanks so much, Dan. Thanks for the intro. Uh, and it's great that our paths keep crossing and that we're doing more and more work together. Um, I also took Dan's BizHack course uh, and learned at least as much about marketing as uh, he learned in my course. Um, so it's just been a great working relationship. Uh, and it's great to see you doing so much good for the community, especially during this time when uh, there was a lot of pressure on small businesses and no one quite knows how to plan. Um, so uh, it's great to be here. I will share my screen. Okay, perfect. And let me just put, uh, I have another monitor over here. So if you see me looking over here, I'm actually looking at your faces. Uh, I am not looking at something else. Okay, great. Now I can see a bunch of you. All right. So. Um, as I said, uh, I've taken the BizHack course and BizHack holds a special place in my heart. Uh, so it's really nice to see all of you here. Um, can you all see my screen? Let me try sharing again. I feel like something didn't work. Okay, can, can you see, see the unicorn? Now. We can see it. Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, I'm gonna drop into presentation mode. Uh, so we're going to talk about financials for small businesses um, and just a little about me. Uh, I work with a lot of startups and small businesses. I am now based in, in Miami, Florida. I've been here for about six years, six and a half years. Moved from New York, uh, also uh, helped build a company in San Francisco. Um, I have run a small business. I have also raised venture capital. Um, uh, and done that whole thing. And that company actually had an exit, which was uh, amazing. Um, and for the past 10 years, I've worked with a lot of different businesses, uh, both helping them in terms of strategy, but also helping them uh, think through how to raise money and how to grow. Um, and I'm really a presentation guy. All of my, pre all of my startups were presentation startups. Uh, but the more I work with with startups and small businesses, the more I realize that the financial stuff is actually a huge stumbling block for people. Uh, so that's, that's what's led me to what I'm doing now, which is Rocket Pro Forma. Um, I post a ton of free resources. Uh, so if you want a hiring plan or um, a template for a financial dashboard, there's a bunch of stuff that I put up on the website. So just go to rocketproforma.com slash resources, ton of free stuff there. Um, and so today uh, we're going to cover financial projections. Uh, a lot of people have a feeling when they're creating financial projections that they're pulling numbers from thin air. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to have fun with accounting. I know that sounds crazy, uh, but we're going to do it. Um, and really, it's just a few things that I wish someone had told me. I started my first business at 25, and I just wish... I had known this stuff. Uh, it does not require going to business school. It does not require going to accounting school. Um, it's just a few core things. And then if we have time, uh, I have a financial projections template. You can find it on the site, on the website I just sent. Um, but I have a template and I'll walk you through why I really like this template, uh, which can be used as a dashboard. You know, I use it as a dashboard in running my own business. And it's also great uh, if you are raising money um, or if you need to present the business to, to anyone, you know, including your business partners or employees or whoever. So the first question is, why do we need financial projections? Um, and a lot of entrepreneurs, honestly, I see a lot of people operating without financial projections. Um, and just to define financial projections, they look forward in time, right? So a, a lot of us have bookkeeping software. We're using QuickBooks. We have a bookkeeper. We have accountants. That tends to be backward looking. Right, so that's historical, but the question is what's coming, right? And that's the piece that I see people trip over. And the core language of business is finance. Um, and I know as entrepreneurs, we get very passionate about our product, our service, our customers, that stuff is all great, um, but the foundation is finance. So we really do need to understand, we don't need to be fluent in the language, but we at least need to speak a little bit of the language. And so 
the things that I use financial projections for and that I find to be crucial, one is just running the business, right? Like how do I look forward so that I know what I can do this month, next month, the month after? How do I plan? How do I hire people, right? Um, I'll tell a story in a minute about how, uh, you know, I really failed with some hiring. Um, but how do I, how do I know how to grow, right? Also, when things don't go the way I expect, how do I know how to handle those problems, right? If I understand the wiring of the business and I have a mental map of how the money flows, I know which levers I can pull as the landscape changes, right? To adjust to the new situation. And then also, um, you know, many of the companies I work with are raising money, not all businesses need to raise money. Uh, in fact, some of my favorite businesses have never raised money, um, but it is also great if you need to explain your finances to someone else and be able to talk to them. And so uh, really what I do um, is try to give people the tools for success. And so just a little bit on the basics of finance. And again, um, we'll cover that during this uh, session creating the mental map of the business so that I understand how cash flows through the business, where the cash is coming from, where it's going, and how I can pull the levers as I need to as the landscape changes. A little bit of research skills, you know, we live in an age when there is so much information available. Um, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Yes, the first step is feeling like you're pulling numbers from thin air, but pretty quickly you can do some research and find at least some educated guesses for the numbers you don't know. Uh, and then I've been building out a financial projections template. I do recommend using a template. Um, you don't have to use mine, uh, but the nice thing about a template is someone has thought through a lot of stuff. Um, so if you're a first timer, you can learn very quickly by seeing what someone else put together. Um, it also acts as kind of a checklist so that you don't forget anything. And if you've already built templates before or used templates before, a great template can save you a ton of time. Um, you know, this, these things take a long time to build. So, uh, you know, I recommend finding a good financial projections template. So, uh, as I said, I started my first business uh, and I have some gray hair. Uh, I started my first company at 25 years old and I was a software developer um, and I was really good at writing software. And very quickly, I got a bunch of clients and started hiring people. And all of a sudden, you know, I had gone from being a developer to being a manager. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I made it up. I was 25, uh, it was going pretty well. Um, and we had about 12 people, we hadn't raised any money. We had a bunch of, you know, big name Fortune 500 customers. And all of a sudden the dot-com crash hit, you know, and the world stopped. Uh, and we don't see that very often, but we've seen it a few times in my career. We saw it in 2020, right? The entire world stopped. And um, what happened was we had uh, a bunch of these big name companies like NBC owed me money, HBO owed me money, uh, um, Time Warner owed me money, like all these companies owed money, but they just stopped paying, right? So the cash flow stopped. And it was really hard to sell new business. Like no one was doing any, any new business at that point. And it turned out, you know, we had this really healthy looking, I'll talk about this in a second. We had a very healthy looking income statement. On paper, we had all this income. Uh, in real life, the cash stopped flowing and we didn't have any buffer. And, um, you know, all of a sudden my business partner and I did the math and realized we had to lay off two thirds of the company. Uh, and that was a really terrible day. Like we had, we had promised these people a career, um, you know, and it turned out we hadn't planned responsibly enough. And that, I mean, that happened a long time ago, but that actually planted the seed for what I'm doing now with Rocket Pro Forma, because I wanna help other people avoid that moment, right? Um, and I was talking to another entrepreneur recently who built, uh, you know, a 150 person company and he had his CFO, his chief financial officer, build a projection that said they could hire 30 more people. So they hired 30 people and then realized there was an error in the projection and they had to lay off half of those people. You know, So it's not just 
it's not just startups that have these problems. It's also established businesses. Like the planning is is hard, and you have to you have to think it through, um, especially when other people's careers are on the line, or when or when my own financial health is on the line, right? So what happened? You know, the economy crashed. We laid a bunch of people off. My business partner left. I held on to the company because we had good tech and we had good clients, and I you know I knew I could turn it around. Um, but I ended up having to dig myself out of a hole. Right, so we had the crash, uh, and then I was left with a bunch of debt. And so what happened with the debt was I eventually paid it back, um, but I learned a few things about debt along the way. And this wasn't debt that I had taken on willingly, right? Like I hadn't planned to take on this debt; it was just kind of forced on me. So debt payments are non-productive, right? Like every time I'm paying five thousand dollars back to the bank or a family member or whoever, that's money that I'm not using to grow my business, right? That's someone I'm not, that's someone's salary I'm not paying every month who could be helping me. Uh, and what's even uh, more critical to understand is that debt can only be paid back out of profit, right? So the company needs to clear a profit in order to pay back debt. If you're not clearing a profit, you're not paying back debt, you're just pushing money around, right? And so what happens with profits uh, is, you know, for a company, you have to pay all your expenses first. And actually for any of us individually as well, you have to pay your rent, you have to pay your insurance and profits are only the money that's left over after paying all of the expenses. And you have to pay taxes on profits, right? So, um, and the tax rates, you know, uh, are not inexpensive in this country. This is also true for credit cards and loans and you know whatever. Uh, and we haven't even talked about the interest on the loan, right? So what that means in a real world example, and this was the part that was kind of like eye-opening for me. So if I'm running a company and this is, uh, I think this is the only math I'm gonna ask you to do today, but this is like, if you're gonna take one thing away from this session, so if I'm running a company that has a 15% profit margin, right? So for every hundred dollars I make, I, you know, I spend on salaries, I spend on rent, I spend on insurance, I make a hundred bucks in revenue. I have $15 left over after I pay all my expenses. If my tax rate is 24%, you know, some combination of corporate taxes and whatever flows through to my personal return, if I'm an LLC or an S corp, how much revenue do you need to pay back $100 in debt, not counting the interest expense? You, you are welcome to use a calculator for this. Uh, I will give you 60 seconds. And then I'll show you the math. And I don't know if you can unmute yourselves, but if you can unmute yourselves, you can post, uh, you can say it. Otherwise, just paste it in the chat if you have an answer. Uh, I'd say close to $150. That good guess, good guess. Anyone else, higher, lower? All right, 10 second countdown, 10. No, we have to give them more time. Come on guys. <laughs> I need at least one more guess. There, Amy 140. and Graham, 140. 140. Anyone else? Yeah, we have a couple in the chat. Can you see those, Mike? Oh yeah, uh, oh, I wasn't scrolling down. So we have, I can read them to you. Amy, Amy Williams, $139 minimum. Graham Hawkins, $877. Kelly, $360, and Mary, $826. We have one correct answer. <laughs> so the correct answer is the most frightening answer, which is $877. So I'm gonna walk you, and we didn't even talk about the interest rate, right? That's just, so the way the math works, you take your $100 and divide by 15%. So that's your profit margin, right? So for every $100 I make, I only clear 15. And then I owe 24% on taxes. So I divide my 667 by one minus 24%. And that's how I get to the 877. And again, we didn't even consider the interest. So think about that, right? 
it takes me $877 of revenue to pay back $100 in debt. And these are not unrealistic numbers, right? 15% profit margin, 24% taxes. Debt gets expensive really, really quickly. And so what I learned in paying back this debt, first of all, I could have bought a, you know, I could have bought a house with, my, <laughs> with what I paid back, a small house, but a house. Um, you know, it just took a lot of work and a lot of time. Uh, and I had a lot of time to think about this. Um, and it definitely changed my planning moving forward, right? And so, uh, you know, I did eventually dig the company out of the hole um, and I hired more people and I built more tech and I got more big name clients, but it took a while. And what my accountant said to me, I kind of remember this conversation. He was like, well, how long did it take you to get into this hole? And I was like, oh, a couple of years. And he's like, well, it'll probably take about that long for you to work your way out of it. Uh, and he was correct. So one thing that I started doing in digging my way out of that hole was I started doing my own bookkeeping. And again, this is another seed that was planted for what I'm doing now, helping companies with their financials. And that really helped me understand how everything fit together um, financially behind the scenes in my company. I don't still do my bookkeeping, but I did it for long enough that I, that I started to understand you know, the puzzle pieces. And I actually have, I have a good friend in New York who built uh, he is a fishmonger, so um, he supplies fish uh, to some pretty big accounts like Whole Foods and Red Lobster. The guy was doing a quarter of a billion dollars in revenue with 10 people in a room, um, like one of the most amazing businesses I've ever seen in my life, uh, and that's billion, quarter of a billion with a B, uh, and he said the same thing. He said, you know, part of what he did was started doing his own bookkeeping, and that really helped him. So if you don't take it from me, take it from someone else, it's worth spending you know, a few months doing your own bookkeeping just to understand how the finances work. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, I've told you my story, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, this is uh, one of the richest people in the world. When he started Microsoft, he had a rule that Microsoft had to keep at least one year of cash on hand. Now it could be invested in you know, securities or some sort of interest bearing account, but they had to be able to get at one year of cash at all times. And his thinking was, look, I've hired all these smart people. If the world stops, which it does, you know, it looks like it stops once every 10 years, right? Uh, if the world stops, I will have a year and a room full of smart people to figure out how to adjust, right? And he's now one of the richest people in the world. I am not. Uh, and if we look at that $877 number, you know, it's cheaper in the long run to keep a bunch of cash around than it is to have debt forced on us that we don't have a plan to pay back. All right, so I picked up the pieces, dug out of the hole, uh, and eventually started another iteration of the same company, brought in a new business partner. We moved uh, the whole thing to the cloud pretty early. This was like 2006, 2007. Uh, we started raising, we raised our first round of venture capital right at the end of 2008, um, 2009, right at the end of 2009, I guess. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a rocket ship, you know? Um, it was a presentation company. We were essentially competing with PowerPoint with this app we built that ran in a browser, which was kind of a novel thing at the time. Um, and so I saw that piece of it. I went from being a small business to being a venture-backed company and got on that whole rocket ride. Um, I've tried it both ways. Both, uh, both were exciting in different ways. Uh, that company eventually got acquired, which was amazing. And um, I had come far enough along that I actually built the financial projections that we used to raise that money. Um, so I'd gone from being financially illiterate to being the the finance guy, uh, you know, I was one of the founders and they were like, hey, you build the financial model. Um, and then the cool thing was we actually used that model to run the business for the first year. So we raised 2 million bucks, um, which also was an amazing moment. Like someone just drops $2 million into your bank account, which was cool. Also a little scary because then you're responsible for their $2 million. Um, but we had this financial plan. So it wasn't just like smoke and mirrors that we put together to raise the money, we actually used it 
to run the business. Did everything go the way we had expected? No. Did we keep using the plan? Yes, we just adjusted it based on you know, what was happening. And so after the company was acquired, I started working with other founders and I started uh, running some accelerator programs. And I was a good enough financial guy at this point that I could build financial models for people. So every once in a while I would build like a fancy financial model for someone. And I realized I was doing them a disservice because they still didn't understand how the, how the, how the model worked. They couldn't talk through the assumptions. They couldn't change the assumptions. And so they still couldn't run their business. They still couldn't pitch investors. And that again was another seed that kind of led me to Rocket Pro Forma, which is trying to put the power back into your hands to, you know, you can make your own updates and I try to make it as easy as possible for you to understand. And I also drop a lot of short videos talking about different concepts into the product. Regardless of how you get to a financial model, these financial projections, these forward-looking financials, this is how you confidently run the business. This is how you plan. Um, and so one of the things I get back from, from founders is they're looking at this template and they go, you know, I can put numbers in here, but I feel like I'm pulling numbers out of thin air, right? And so in a perfect world, we would have historical data. You know, we would have been running our business long enough that we kind of know how to project forward. Um, but what I see a lot of the time is there is an initial stage where you are literally pulling numbers out of thin air and that's okay. Um, that is the first step. Like it's okay to feel that way. Just go through whatever template you're using, fill out all the numbers, even if they're wrong, that will A, create the mental map inside your head. You, know, you start to think about how those things fit together and B, you'll end up with some questions, right? Like, what should I put in for this number? What should I put in for that number? And the second step is researching likely answers. Again, we, are, we live in an age where there is a wealth of information, um, both on the internet and with mentors and people you can talk to. So you can probably get something that's in the ballpark, even if it's not gonna be correct. The third piece is starting to use your own numbers. Um, unfortunately for most of us, the place we get expert at first is usually expenses because the expenses are real every month. The customer acquisition, the revenue, sometimes that stuff takes a little longer. But as we start running the parts of our business, we can get, get better at predicting um, you know, what those are gonna be. I think for most of you on this call, if I ask you, tell me what your revenues are going to be in January, you can maybe give me a range if I asked you what your expenses are gonna be in January, most of you can probably give me a pretty exact number, right? Like that's the way these things work. And then as we grow, we get better at using the data that we have. Um, we have a bunch of experience and usually we end up hiring some people who can help us with this, right? We hire other executives or talented people um, who can help us figure this stuff out in their particular section of the company. And that's just the projection, like you're gonna feel like you're pulling numbers out of thin air at the beginning and that's totally fine. And I think the most important thing if you're doing this for the first time is building that mental model of your business. This is what is gonna allow you to adjust as the landscape changes. And I think the one thing we all know is the landscape is definitely gonna change. Um, so getting that mental model in place, even if the numbers are wrong, once you understand how the pieces fit together, you know, you really, you really stand a, a fighting chance out there. So I do want to take a second um, and just ask, is there anything specific that any of you want to get out of this session? Uh, I'm super curious. If not, I can keep talking, but I thought I would take a request or two if there's anything here. Sure. I know um, hopefully a lot of folks are interested if they haven't already in their 2021 forecast. So how to kind of project forward, um, you know, any advice or tips on how to build a financial forecast for the year ahead? Yes. Um, okay, that's Audrey, good. Anything? Audrey Salazar wrote prediction in the pandemic. Yep. How can you kind of scenario plan? Uh, Kelly Rivas said, do you have an example of a P&L? Uh, Amy Williams wrote 2020 really screwed with our revenue. How can we forecast when 2020 was such an anomaly? Melissa Fran, 
said, I'm interested in your template so I can start tracking and project for Event Village, which is her business. Sorry, someone was going to say something? Yeah, this is Martha. So a lot of these grant applications that we've been filling out are asking for our profit and loss statements, but but they don't really ask for our projections. So I was, um, it's kind of like Amy's question, right? How do we use profit and loss statements to um, project the future? And I've done this in fundraising because I'm, I'm from the nonprofit sector. We have to project the budget. Mm -hmm. And what I what I would do is I projected like a, a you know, a bare bones budget, like what we needed to survive. But then I had a dream budget. Like this is what we want, but this is our bare minimum. So I had two models, right? One which I knew would help us uh, survive through a difficult year, but another model, which is like what we really wanted, what we were shooting for, what everybody was working towards. Perfect, thank you, Marta. Mm -hmm. Tati McDaniel asked how your contingency plan should shift in a pandemic versus normal times. And Amy also asked resources for battling debt over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marta. Sure. Those are all great questions. Uh, I'm actually gonna skip, based on those questions, let me just skip to the template part because I think that will actually frame the conversation in a really nice way. And then we can circle back around. And I believe we'll get access to these slides, right? So that we can share them with yeah. folks. Yeah, one of the benefits of out. registering and attending is you get the slides. Okay. Uh, so I can answer a ton of the questions right now. Um, if you are battling debt, uh, the bad news is you can only pay debt back out of profits. Um, the good news is you can push money around which means finding lower priced debt, right? So the more that you can reduce the interest rate, the more that you can push back the payments, um, you know, eventually you have to figure out some revenue and you have to figure out some profit in order to actually pay back the debt. Um, I think someone mentioned grants, you know, if you can find grants, grants. So I was in New York, um, not that far from the World Trade Center when, uh, you know, the 9-11 the happened and uh, I got a grant, you know, I got a grant from the city and it really helped. Um, we had just been rebuilding after the dot-com crash uh, and I used the grant to pay some salaries. You know, there's PPP financing. Um, I would be looking at all of that stuff where you can get some money and not have to pay it back. And I would also be looking, you know, how can you get lower interest rates on stuff? Um, but I can tell you from experience, there's no easy answer. Uh, that is also why you see, you know, high growth startups going out and raising money because that money isn't debt, right? Yes, you have to sell a piece of your company, but you don't have to pay back that debt. So sometimes that can be uh, an option for certain companies as well. That, that's a whole other uh, set, uh, webinar on the responsibilities and what your life will look like if you get on that path, which may not be what you're looking for if you're a small business owner. Um, but we can do that webinar uh, another time. So a lot of the questions were around the, the template and forecasting. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Okay. So this is the template that I recommend. Um, and most small business owners, and this was my response when I first looked at this, have this response, right? It just sets off this like panic, right? We see all these numbers and we're like, I don't know what that is. Uh, so what we're going to do in the next seven minutes is we're going to get, is we're going to build this back up, right? So we're going to go from this feeling to at least having, you know, some comfort with what we're looking at here. So what happened, right? What happened is overload kicked in. And um, these tend to be the things that causes the overload. We look at something and we see a lot of math and we're just like, I don't want to deal with the math, right? We also see lots of little boxes and uh, it just like, there's just uh, too much information there. Uh, because of accountants, there are also different types of costs. So there's not just one expense category, there are several expense categories. Um, and there are also on my template, there were a few different financial statements working together, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
And then there are also lags. So money is always in motion. Um, and if we have time, I'll do a little five minute uh, primer on cash versus accrual accounting. But the short story is cash is instant. And some of the accounting that we do is instant and some is accrual. So accrual works more like a credit card where I get the benefit of um, agreeing to pay the money, but I also get the benefit of being able to wait to pay out the actual cash. Right? And so what you're seeing is math and motion and different accounting categories on that page. And that's what creates the overload. Um, the good news is the math is really mostly just addition and subtraction. It's not complicated math. There's just, uh, you're seeing a lot of math, right? There is a little bit of multiplication and there is a little bit of division often express, expressed as percentages, but there's nothing more complicated than that. So it's basic math, there's just, like I said, a lot of little boxes. Um, and so there are three main financial statements and I'll circle back around to this, but I wanna talk about the template first. One of those financial statements is the income statement. And the core of my template is the income statement. So revenue minus expenses gives you a profit or loss. That's the basic formula of, I mean, that's the basic formula of all accounting, but that's the basic formula of the income statement, which is also called the profit and loss statement or P and L. So here's one slice of that larger, um, that larger document that I showed you. And so there is a line marked revenue. There's a little bit of information about growth in revenue. So we're looking at month eight here. There is cost of goods sold, which is one type of expense. And there are operating expenses, which is a second type of expense. These are coming from the accountants. So if we subtract the cost of goods sold, the first type of expense from the revenue, we're left with gross profit. And that gives you a gross margin. You'll hear people talk about the gross margins in the, in the business. This is how much money you have to pay your expenses and then still have a profit. Then we pay the expenses. In this example, in true startup, fashion, we're spending more money than we make. So we end up in debt. You end up losing money that month. Um, and then that gives us uh, a uh, profit margin percentage. So this is the core. Now what I've done on the template, um, which again, I use as a dashboard when running the business. And uh, I also um, help startups when they go to pitch investors or uh, business partners or whoever, this adds some more information. So one thing I do recommend when I'm looking at these numbers, I've divided everything by a thousand and I've taken away the decimals. And what this does is it makes it just easier. It takes some of the information overload off the screen. You typically don't need the decimals and you typically can divide by a thousand. Um, hopefully all of us on this call can get to the point where we can divide by a million. Uh, I look forward to that day. But right now we're gonna divide by a thousand. So when I see 48 here, that means 48,000. And when I see minus 66, that means we lost a crazy amount of money this month, right? So the income statement doesn't give enough info. Um, short story, it's on the accrual basis, which means there's a lag. And this is how I got myself into trouble when I told you my story. Um, you know, my income statement was healthy, right? We had revenue coming in we just couldn't collect it. So uh, I've added some other stuff to my dashboard that helps me run the business at a glance. So here's the income statement and then you'll see some other stuff. So above it, I have one, two, maybe three key metrics that drive the business. So in this case, I'm selling transactions. Here's how many transactions we did in month eight. We did almost a thousand. So it could be the number of sales, the number of subscribers, it could be the number of active users. If you're running a subscription business, it's annual recurring revenue, monthly recurring revenue, number of paid subscribers. Again, it's information on how many transactions, you know, what, what is the, the key thing that we're selling here and how is that growing, shrinking, staying the same over time? Then I wanna know the headcount um, and Two things I really like about the headcount number. One is, you know, as a business owner, I need to plan for the headcount um, and I need to hopefully grow the headcount over time as the business grows. 
And two, I really like the metric of average annual revenue per employee, sometimes FTE, which is full-time equivalent. Um, you know, for most small businesses, this is probably in the $150,000 to $500,000 range of average revenue per employee per year. And so this helps me kind of sanity check, am I hiring at a, a reasonable rate? Um, you know, your actual results may differ wildly from what I just said. There are industry specific, this is something you can research on the internet, or um, I actually have a link up on the site. So you can find your industry and see, you know, average revenue per employee. Uh, you can also track expenses per employee. That's sometimes a good number as well. And the income statement, because it's on the accrual basis, lies about cash. So if you're ever talking to an accountant or an investor or a business mentor, the first thing they want to see is your income statement, right? And so they want to see revenue, cost of goods sold, gross profit, operating expenses, and either EBITDA or net profit. That's what we're going to report to the government, right? But there's a lag. I haven't necessarily collected all that money. I haven't necessarily paid all that money. There's a lag, which is part of the reason you don't have to pay taxes um, for a few months after the end of the year so that you have time to collect the money in order to be able to afford to pay the taxes. So invariably, the next question, when you show someone the income statement, which they want to see first, the next question is, great, can I see your cash flow statement? So I got tired of having to go dig out the cash flow statement. And so again, income statement, cash flow statement, balance sheet, income statements on the accrual, cash flow statements on the cash basis, balance sheet is on the accrual basis. So I got tired of having to run for the, um, I'll come back to this in a second. I got tired of having to run and find the cash flow statement. So I just put a little piece of the cash flow statement right at the bottom of my dashboard. So now I can see the income statement and I can see my cash position. Plus if I'm taking in any loans or grants or raising any money, that affects my cash position. So I break that out as its own line. Now in the background, I have way more information than this, but this is enough that I can glance and see what happened in month eight. And then I can compare it to month seven or month nine, right? And I can start to see the patterns. Um, and there are all different reasons that the income statement lies about cash. There's accounts receivable, uh, which is what I had. I had, you know, NBC made me wait 90 days before they paid me. So I declared the income when I invoiced them, but I didn't get the cash for months, right? Accounts payable is the reverse of that. I make people wait before I pay them. So when they invoice me, I declare the expense on my income statement, but it may be two weeks before I actually pay out the cash. So there's a lag. Um, there are other reasons, other things that don't appear in the income statement. I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, but the cash is important, right? Startups live or die on cash. I had to lay people off with a healthy income statement because you know we ran out of cash. Uh, and if you're raising money, you know this is the cash story is important because that's really what you're raising for. You're raising for the cash flow, not for uh, the income statement. All right. So we are gonna build up that scary looking uh, chart that I showed you at the beginning and hopefully it'll feel a little more friendly. So here's one month. This is basically what I just showed you except for looking at month one instead of month eight. The only thing I did was change uh, the key metrics up here. So in this case, this is a subscription business. Here's my number of paid subscribers and here's my annual recurring revenue, which is calculated um, by taking this month's subscription revenue and multiplying it by 12. Uh, you can see the income statement here, revenue minus cost of sales gives us a gross profit, minus the operating expenses gives us EBITDA or a net profit or loss. You can see my headcount and you can see my cash position. So this is month one. Now I may break out individual months. For some companies, I may break out all 12 months. Um, and then I used to break out all 12 months, uh, but I found that that gets a little overwhelming. So in order to reduce the amount of information on the slide, on the dashboard, I started doing quarters. So I get the first three months granular, and then I get uh, quarters, which is chunks of three months. Then I summarize one year, summarize two years, summarize, uh, summarize year two, 
summarize year three. So this year one column is a summary of this breakout. And then year two is new information and year three is new information. And now I can see patterns over time, right? And so if I look, sorry, if I look, you know, you will see, I don't sell anything. It takes, it's taking me two months on this projection um, in order to, to start to sell some paid subscriptions and then the revenue starts coming in, right? Um, or the ARR starts coming in, the revenue, I'm apparently not charging very much for these subscriptions. Uh, and you can see I'm running a bunch of expense and I lose some money in year one, but then I start to make some money in year two and year three. So once I have this basic template, and this is something you can grab off of my website, you can grab this template, just rocketperformer.com slash resources, um, you know, this layout in either a presentation format or a spreadsheet format. Once I have this, I can feed in the historical data. So, you know, the stuff I have in QuickBooks, the stuff I have with my bookkeeper, the stuff I have with my accountant, um, at its simplest level, let's ignore the pandemic. I'll talk about the pandemic in a second. At its simplest level, I can take my historicals and now start to project forward. And I could do it with a growth rate and say, you know, I'm seeing an average of 10% growth a month. I might have to factor in some seasonality. You know, I sell way better in December than I do in January. Maybe that's part of my uh, projections. Maybe it's not. Maybe I start to really look at my customer acquisition channels. You know, I'm spending 500 bucks a month on Facebook ads. What if I increase that to 1500 a month? What if I increase that to 2000 a month? You know, I can start to do some math based on my customer acquisition costs, just like we learned in the BizHack class. You know, and assuming I can keep acquiring customers at that rate or at that cost, what does that do to my sales? And if I'm going to be bringing in more customers, do I have enough staff and supplies to support that new business? You know, these are the questions I start to ask. And for me, everything starts from the revenue, which really is driven by these key metrics. So how many of whatever I'm selling can I sell? What does that mean in terms of revenue? What does that mean of, in terms of cost of sales, which is essentially the variable cost that I incur as I sell more or less units? And then how can I plan my operating expenses to match what I'm expecting? And again, the challenge that all of us are dealing with is that the expenses are real and the revenue is imaginary. You know, even if I have 12 months of data, something crazy might happen in the world this month and stop the revenue cold while my expenses keep moving forward. Um, so that's where that buffer comes in, right? Do I have some cash on hand? Do I have a line of credit? Do I have some ability to adjust if there's a, a crazy shock in the world or we go back into lockdown or whatever? Um, now, dealing with the pandemic, this is, uh, I wanna say it's a once in a lifetime event, like the specifics of the pandemic are once in a lifetime, but I have seen the world stop before. It hasn't ever stopped for a year before. Um, but I will say things always come back, right? Um, and I've seen some crazy stuff. Like I was not that far away from the World Trade Center uh, and stuff does come back. So I don't feel like, you know, I don't feel like the world is gonna stay stopped forever. I do think in retrospect from my own career and my own financial planning, you know, I always wish I had more of a cash buffer um, and I always wish I had cut expenses more quickly. Right, because again, expenses are real, revenue is imaginary. So the sooner I can cut expenses, the more time I can give myself to figure things out. Um, or if I'm like Bill Gates, I have a year of cash on hand and I don't need to worry about it right at this moment. Um, but I, I do think with the, the pandemic, it is really hard to plan, right? Um, and so then the question becomes, you know, can I shift some of my business online um, or to somewhere that's a little less threatened if we go into another lockdown or if we go into another crisis. Um, and it's sort of beyond this webinar for me to go too far down that rabbit hole, but I'm happy to connect, you know, uh, if you want. Do we have, I just talked for a really long time. Are there questions? 
Yeah, so Audrey Salazar asked, what suggestions do you have for those that do not have multiple years of data? So I think you got to make it up. Um, and for me, uh, so here's my short answer. And um, this is my template. Again, you don't have to use my template. I'm just going to show you how I think about this, right? So my template produces this dashboard as an output. So all the changes I make in the template update this automatically. It produces the income statement, the cash flow statement, and the balance sheet as an output. So you'll see there are actually little locks on these, which just means they're being created automatically. So I think this is what everyone thinks of when they think of a financial projections template. Like I'm gonna have to go in and fill out all these boxes and this is crazy and I don't know what all these numbers mean. Again, in my world, these are outputs. So my job in creating the financial projections is to go to this assumptions tab and answer questions about the next three years. Um, so I answer questions about what am I selling? I answer questions about pricing and potentially discounting. Um, I answer questions and I have a couple of things specific to different businesses. Um, I answer questions about uh, you know, once I know what I'm selling and what it costs, how many sales am I going to do, right? And I can do that either in terms of magical thinking, like I'm just going to sell a hundred of these a month, um, right? Whatever it is, I'm selling a hundred a month. And let's say I have no growth in sales. So I'm selling a hundred a month, every month, that's 1200 a year, 1200 a year, 1200 a year, but maybe I can grow that. Maybe it's a hundred in the first month, 105 in the second month, 110 in the third month, right? So now I'm modeling a little bit of growth and you'll actually see, um, this is my three-year model here. You now see I have a curve and you can see that I'm basically, um, you know, I'm doing about 1600 units, almost doubling that in year two, and then not quite doubling that again in year three. And you can see the number of transactions and you can see the revenue that goes along with that. So this is always my first pulling numbers out of thin air is just let's pull some numbers out of thin air, right? If I go deeper down the rabbit hole, I can start planning uh, you know, my, my actual customer acquisition plan. So I start looking at my website. I start looking at, um, you know, am I selling? Maybe I, as a founder, am selling deals. Maybe I'm running paid ads. You know, I can turn on or off paid ads in this model. And then using the stuff I've learned in BizHack, um, I can add my cost per click, my conversion ratio, that will give me a cost to acquire each customer. As I run a, an ad budget, I will acquire customers at that rate and those will turn into revenue, right? Um, I can acquire customers through SEO. I can hire a direct sales team. I can have channel partners. Um, you know, so I can start to, as a second layer, I can start to really map this out a little bit better. Um, and then I can start to think about the expenses, right? What are the cost of goods sold for what I'm selling? And then what, you know, what am I paying in rent and insurance and lawyers and credit card fees? But it's all done this way, you know, just assumptions over three years, which is producing the pitch deck slide, the income statement. So it's much more fun for me because I can just play, you know, if I change um, my rent, right? Like this year, my rent's gonna be zero. All of my dashboard, my income statement, my cash flow statement, all of that is updated for me. And now I can go through, you know, now I have a business with transactions. I have revenue. The cost of goods sold is tracking the revenue. Now I can start looking at my expenses, right? So I can look at the rent, I can look at the insurance, I can look at the lawyers and I can look at my hiring plan, right? So I can start to say, okay, you know, I'm paying myself 75,000 a month. I'm gonna hire some other people. These are the months I'm gonna bring them on. Um, in, in a lot of the startups I work with, this leads to uh, needing to raise some money to build the business. This is not a real financial plan by, by the way, this is just, uh, you know, I, this is not a real $5 million number. Um, but this, this plan will tell me, look, you know, I need $200,000 in the first six months in order to get this thing off the ground. 
But that's my answer to your question, right? Is I go in here and I start messing around with this and I work from the business model down to the pricing, down to where the sales coming from, down to the costs, down to the hiring, figure out, you know, am I losing money? Am I making money? If I'm losing money, how am I going to finance it? Um, Amy Williams asked, what other types of metrics or KPIs would you recommend for line one, which I think was either transactions or like MRR? And yeah. Um, and she, she's a distributor, so she's being she's okay. selling through channel partners. And Marta Segura asked, does it have a field to describe data for your vendors or subcontractors? So the short answer is um, there's a little bit of that. Uh, and usually with this template, depending on the business, like this template tends to get me 90% of the way there, 95% of the way there. There is a whole thing about channel partners um, here, so I can turn on the partner section, uh, and then model that out. I think these KPIs, and again, I recommend one to three on this dashboard, your business will have more metrics than this. It's not like your whole business were run off of three metrics, but the ones that, that I find that the startups I work with most are the number of sales, and I have kind of three different business models here, transactions, which is virtual, units, which is some kind of physical fulfillment, whether it's drop ship, or I'm holding inventory, or I'm manufacturing inventory, and subscriptions. Then there are some metrics around annual recurring revenue, monthly recurring revenue for subscriptions, sellers and buyers. A lot of my startups are launching marketplaces, gross merchandise value. You know, if I'm running a marketplace, there's a whole lot of revenue happening that I'm not collecting, but that's an important metric. And then also cost to acquire a customer is often a good one. You know, I can see the cost to acquire a customer drop or rise over time. And that affects my business, affects my unit economics, affects my pricing. So those are the ones that I include here. That being said, you know, for your specific business, you may have some key metrics that I haven't, I haven't put here. And sometimes with, with entrepreneurs, I'll go in and rewire some stuff and do some custom stuff for them. Um, and Melissa you may be able to find a great template. Whether this linked okay. to QuickBooks. Uh, I just wanna say one more thing. You may be able to find a great template for your type of business too. Like if you have a specific business, there may be a template that's perfect for you that I would recommend you use. Um, this does not link to QuickBooks. Uh, and I, I go back and forth on that. What I do um, is I tend to bring people's stuff in. So here's one. What I do is I'll bring in the QuickBooks as an input um, right now and I just do it manually. So here's the output from QuickBooks, right? And I just brought it in as a tab and then I used that. Sometimes I will actually wire it up. So I'm doing like a three month rolling average of revenue or whatever. Um, and I'll use that to drive some of the assumptions. Sometimes I will create uh, a custom tab. So in this case, they had some very specific, you know, business specific um, assumptions that I put in here. Um, so it just kind of depends, but right now I'm doing that QuickBooks integration by hand. That being said there, and, and I tend to deal with a lot of um, pre-revenue companies so there are certainly, um, you know, apps out there, subscriptions that you can buy that will plug into your QuickBooks if that's if that's super important to you. Well, Mike, um, this is so important and I know really intimidating for a lot of business owners, um, but it also sometimes it feels like you're driving with a cloudy windshield. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, that's so right. Th thank you for for this kind of taste. And, you know, you have an online course and you have a lot of support materials and, and you want to talk about some next steps in terms of how we can continue our learning. Yes. Uh, so there's a code BizHack New Year that you can use on the site that will give you a discount on anything on the site. There's also a ton of free stuff on the site. So if you go to resources, there's a bunch of stuff that's just free. If you want the actual spreadsheet that I just showed you. Uh, this is a paid download, but this is this is the coupon. And then uh, Dan just went through my course. Um, I'm launching another course on January 25th. 
the last week of January, which does a deeper dive into, into the stuff we just talked about. Um, and the coupon will work on the spreadsheet and on the course, or if you want to book some time with me, the coupon will work with that also. And one thing I will say, and I don't, I don't think it's true of this group, um, hopefully it's not as true of this group, but what I see in the startup community is people start these businesses and don't do the financial projections. And then what happens is they go to talk to investors and all of a sudden they need the financial projections. So they're in, a, they're in this crisis. Like I have to show this to this investor next week. What do I do? And really, you know, in my experience, it's a much more productive conversation to do this proactively, right? Again, you don't have to use my template. You don't have to use my course, but figure this stuff out, right? Find a template you like, um, start thinking through your financial projections and you will become much better at running your business. Things will go more smoothly. When the world stops, you'll be able to adjust better. And it doesn't have to be like a last minute scramble, you know? Um, that's just what I've learned in my own career. And I've whacked myself in the head a few times with this. Well, you know, there's a really powerful analogy, I think, between your business's financials and your digital marketing. And it's this, most of us became business owners because we loved doing the thing that our business does. So you're a, a baker of pies and so you, own, you start a bake shop. Um, and what we realize sometimes sooner, sometimes later, is that when we became a business owner and we usually become a business owner because we think we can make more money and have more freedom, we then quickly realize that there are things that come with the business owner seat that we didn't necessarily uh, bargain on. And one of those is financials and the other is marketing and sales. Um, and so in order for you to fully fill the seat that many of you are in as owners of your business, you need to invest time in educating yourself about financials and educating yourself about digital marketing. And just like Mike said, be your own bookkeeper for a few months so that you can experience that. We recommend you be your own marketer for a few months so that you can experience that. And then once you've learned by doing, not just theoretically how to do this, you're much better positioned to then hire people and manage them effectively to do it for you. Um, and I know that like right now I'm kind of knee deep in or elbow deep, I should say, in building out my financial forecast for 2021 with the help of Mike's course uh, and this really exciting template, uh, which is a very nifty um, little, little uh, technology that he's built. And we're very early, uh, we're very early in Mike's um, evolution as a business. You know, he, what, how long have you been doing this now? About a year and a half or so? No, not even like, well, I guess I've been building the template off and on for like five years, but basically April 1st, right after COVID hit, I was like, this is, you know, I need to really focus on this. So I've been doing it full time since April 1st, thinking like, this is the way I can help the most people, right? People need to start businesses, pivot businesses, figure out cash crunches like this. This is how I could best help. Yeah. Uh, and Melissa, who's a BizHack alumnus uh, who runs a marketplace, a two-sided marketplace, might be interested in your course. They can just go to rocketproforma.com if they're yes. interested in enrolling. And if you yeah, need... and there's there's a link to the course landing page just on rocketproforma.com. Here's the direct link. It's actually get.rocketproforma.com/course. Right. Good marketing. You embedded the call to action in the URL. Uh, there you go. You try.bizhack.com. Um, I, the other thing I want to say is you might be like, well, why is a digital marketing training academy doing a course on financials? And one of the big things that we've come to recognize at BizHack is that we're really about technology-driven um, resources for business owners. And Mike has built a beautiful technology, a, a beautiful um, way to help business owners, especially small business owners, really get a handle on their business. And in a sense, Facebook has done the same thing, Google has done the same thing. And so in many ways, we feel uh, that Mike's mission at Rocket Proforma and BizHack's mission 
we're serving the same types of customers and are very aligned in terms of leveraging technology tools to help you grow your business and manage your expenses. So um, I think this year in season three, you're gonna start to see uh, a little bit more of a variety of different types of presenters, folks who are talking about things that go maybe a little bit beyond just the narrower scope of digital marketing to talk about um, technology driven marketing, sales, financials, uh, expense control, software, best practices. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of wrap up uh, just talking a little bit about uh, what's coming up in the next few weeks. Um, actually, I'm excited to share that next week, um, I'm gonna be on Capitol Hill, at least virtually, uh, advocating on behalf of small businesses everywhere uh, and really asking Congress to do more to help us. This is part of the Storm the Hill initiative that Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program of which I'm an alumni is organizing. Uh, I'm gonna be the captain of a group that meets with uh, Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz of Florida District 23. Uh, she's a uh, representative in the House of Representatives. And we're also going to be meeting uh, with Marco Rubio, Rick Scott. And um, I think there are more than a thousand business owners that are part of this Storm the Hill initiative. And I'm, I'm going to be there advocating on your behalf for more funding and more support for small businesses. Uh, Congress has simply not done nearly enough for us to help us through this difficult period. Um, that's going to actually happen during our normal BizHack Live slot, so I'll be, we'll take a break that week. Um, on the 20th and two weeks from today, um, I'm going to be pulling together everything that we've talked about um, in the Pinecrest course and in the Digital Marketers Edge course uh, into what we call the BizHack lead building system. And so we're going to have a session uh, that really talks about um, what BizHack has learned about generating leads online, uh, over the course of the last seven years of working with nearly a thousand businesses closely on doing it. And I'm very excited. This will be kind of the first time we have presented this lead building system in a really consolidated and coherent uh, format, not split up over multiple sessions, but really uh, condensed down into one really dynamite hour. So I highly recommend you attend that. And then the week after that, we're going to be talking about networking for business growth, uh, how to turn your contacts into sales. Uh, Jack Killian is the author of Network All the Time, Everywhere with Everybody. And he has just fantastic, some of these are more traditional approaches, but that translate beautifully into the new world. Um, and he's going to be a great presenter. Um, I did want to encourage those of you who uh, are interested in supporting uh, BizHack and, and being getting those automatic invites and, and the copies of the presentations to become a season pass holder. And those of you who are interested in our upcoming uh, five-week course, I would first of all advise you to get moving. Uh, we are three quarters full and we are going to sell out. January is always our most popular course uh, because people are looking to upgrade and renovate. Um, and uh, we have a lot of folks uh, on today's call uh, who are uh, coming up uh, and going to be a part of it. Jane Moore, uh, Audrey Salazar, great to see you guys. We also have a number of alumni, uh, Susan Howe, Michael Pearson, and others who have gone through the program and um, have had uh, oftentimes really uh, impressive results. Um, and uh, we're going to be uh, offering scholarships to uh, women and minority-owned businesses. Uh, we've given out uh, nearly $100,000 uh, in scholarships in 2020, and we hope to beat that this year. Again, you can go to try.bizhack.com slash scholarship to apply for a scholarship. We're also going to be holding next Thursday, a week from tomorrow, an info session at 2 p.m., where I'll answer any of the questions that you might have about the course itself. You can go to try.bizhack.com slash um, live info session uh, to learn more about that. Um, and I just wanted to start this parting thought. Um, one of my favorite entrepreneurs is Tony Shea and his motto was have fun. He started Zappos. Uh, he got a mohawk <laughs> uh, while he was running Zappos, uh, which got acquired by Amazon. He's a billionaire business mogul. Uh, and there he is with his mohawk. Tony tragically died uh, last year in a house fire, uh, but his, um, legacy and, and his message lives on. And so my message to you for 2021 is have fun.
the game's a lot more enjoyable when you're trying to do more than just make money. So um, with that, I just want to say have fun, everybody. We'll see you here uh, in two weeks for the BizHack Lead Building System webinar. And thank you, Mike, for your uh, amazing presentation and all that you've done uh, on behalf of small businesses everywhere. Thanks so much, everyone. And Happy New Year. Thank you, guys. Great kicking up, kick off to season three and uh, Jane and others who are part of uh, co the course that's coming up. Uh, really looking forward to working closely with you. And um, Pam Stein, it's great to see you here. Ramon, uh, dear friend. Uh, Sylvia, nice to see you. Susan, Victor, Zena. Thank you, everyone. Rochelle, Marta, uh, Michael Pearson, Jessica, Jamar, uh, Janine, George, Graham, Desmond, Darren. Hey, Darren. Christy, uh, my uh, cousin uh, by um, soon marriage is Audrey. Hi, Audrey. Uh, Amy, Tati, one of our great instructors, Armando. Thank you all so much. Tati, I see you took yourself off mute. Did you want to say something? No. Okay. All right, everybody. Have a good one.